Yes, so really what I'm trying to do is just give you a snapshot of some of the work that's being done uh, in the Centre for High Performance Polymers. So I'm just going to introduce you first to the centre. This is a virtual centre. Um, what we mean by that is that we have a range of research groups that link together under the same umbrella. We share equipment, we share um, sometimes grants and so on, and, and we uh, uh, work together on integrating skill sets. So we have biopolymer applications, um, and it's across dentistry, anatomy, as well as some of the agricultural applications and some of the more industrial work. A lot of nanocomposite, nanostructured polymers, um, nanomac, new industries, and some high value manufacturing. So we are skilled in doing work around synthesis, polymer synthesis, through to characterization and processing. We have a very um, extensive set of, of processing equipment that is, is probably unique in Australia, and property performance testing. So given that, this centre sits across three buildings, and I don't know if anyone's actually been across to the new, oops, sorry, the new um, advanced engineering building, but we're sitting in that building. We have a lot of polymer gear over there. That's a, a, a bit of a luxurious place to be sitting. And the AIBN and also UQ Long Pocket will be setting up some labs across there sh shortly. In the advanced engineering building, we have a new centre, Advanced Materials Processing and Manufacturing, and that integrates us even further into materials people in mining, defence, transport, and some of the metals guys. So we're trying to integrate skill sets so we can deliver manufacturing solutions. Okay, most of the work that I've been doing over the last number of years has been in sustainable polymers. Sustainable polymers across a, a, a variety of, of applications. And why are we doing this? Well, there are a lot of different drivers for sustainable polymers, and it really depends on the country, it uh, depends on the region, and it depends on the industry needs. But there are some consistent drivers, and one of them is improving the balance between uh, the environmental benefits and impact of plastics. And I'm sure all of you are aware of how ubiquitous plastics are nowadays. You're also aware that most of them are very, very long-lived in the environment, and that this is causing increasing problems, particularly with uh, filling up landfill and some of the material that uh, doesn't get appropriately recycled and ends up in the environment. There's agriculture packaging, biomedical applications, and some of the biomaterials have a very important place in advanced me medical materials. At the moment, in the Australian chemical plastics industry, we have a very high imbalance between import costs and export sales. We want to do something to address that as well to help the local industry. And of course, there is a strong interest in re renewable resources. So given those drivers, what are we doing? I'm going to cover three of the projects that we're looking at. The first is uh, starch-based biopolymer packaging and films. This is work that has been driven for a very long time, started with the CRC for food packaging a long time ago, and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, Pete Halley, who's now head of School of Chemical Engineering, was uh, one of the key people here at UQ, and Mike Gidley as well has been very heavily involved, Mike Gidley with, through Coffee. Um, I'm also talking about the polyhydroxyalkanoates work that I've been involved in for the last five years, um, and this is poly, uh, material from waste, uh, waste, waste feedstocks and waste biomass, and then uh, CRC for polymers and the sustainable films for agriculture. So starting with the starch-based films, this started in 1995, so a very significant time ago. Um, the IP was actually commercialised in 2002 with a spin-off company called Plantic. Plantic is still a strong international company producing starch films and plastics. It commercialised one type of technology and it's in a continual, continual uh, optimization reinvention process. So we have a long, an ongoing commitment to research with that company. Um, there have been further ARC and CRC funded projects and the current project is, is scheduled for another couple of years' life. 
sometimes there is a question about whether it's appropriate to, to use starch for packaging and um, there is a, a lot of work that's gone into estimating the hectares per annum, tons of biopolymer per hectare per annum for the various types of polymers that you could produce and starch blends are up here as being between, you know, around 10 to 30 tons per hectare per annum. There is a question about whether or not that's achievable and affordable. If you look at the statistics at present, it's, uh, it's perfectly feasible. It takes very little of the land use to convert these polymers to plastics on the type of tonnage that we're looking at. In terms of how we make these materials, there's a process that is involved. And the first stage is to optimise the actual compounding. And through these sorts of, uh, this is a little polylab extruder. So we, we have to work for uh, quite a lot of the early stages involved working out how to actually get these materials processed to give us the sort of materials that could be blown to give us reliable and good product. This is the type of pilot scale blowing operation that we do at UQ. So we take a material that comes through that extruder and blow it up through a column with air inside to give us these stretched materials. This is how it's done commercially on a much larger scale as well with all the polyethylene type polymers. So some of these shapes are unstable, some are stable. And in this case, we have to do blends with polyesters and nanocomposites in order to be able to get these kind of materials that are of commercially relevant property, have commercially relevant properties. The work that's being done at the moment is actually advancing to the point where we don't actually need any of the other ingredients in the mix and we're trying to actually get just pure starch with a good thin polymer. Okay, so what, what this table is demonstrating is that these are the standards, um, the, the properties that are required for particular packaging applications and so on. And our test strength and elongation was acceptable. So the film requirements were met and that took quite a lot of time. Tear strength was improved by nanocomposite and addition. One of the things I wanted to talk, touch on was the fact that we, these materials have been used in agricultural applications and trialled as a very wide film for use as mulch films in the field. It took a little bit of uh, effort, but correct lay flat and thickness was achieved. And this is how the material looked when it was laid in the field. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen mulch film actually being laid, but it's just a roll out process and the edges are buried as, as you go. And it turned out that this particular trial was successful. Um, we found that we got no weed growth, growth, good soil condition retention, good film quality and coverage and good crop yields. So that was a success. But unfortunately, one of the issues around the use of these materials is that they are expensive in comparison with some of the much cheaper polyethylene based mulch films that are out there. So at this point, uh, this project hasn't been continued. Some of the other applications for starch that have been used uh, include making these pots. This is injection moulding and that, that's a different process to th film blowing. It actually, you press shapes using the starch. And the beauty is that while we have these pots that have a reasonable lifetime, eventually they will degrade completely in the environment. So you, you can use them for these traps to, to trap the mosquitoes, but you're not going to have that pool of water long term. Okay, so it's, it's going to reduce the cost and health risks in collection. And it was, uh, the application was for <coughs> control of dengue fever. These are the trays that have been commercialised. So this is like the first commercial product that, that came out from the Plantic spin-off. These trays had high biodegradability and they were basically water soluble. So, so long as they were dry, they were very good trays for um, containers. This work won the Eureka Prize. We got a lot of venture capital for the spin-off and a lot of continued research grants to optimise the material properties for these films, these plastic trays. And this is an example of one of the commercial releases. So some of the Cadbury trays in 2003. One of the things that we do need to focus on is um, control of that, that moisture 
ingress into, into starch films. And there's a lot of work underway at the moment to, to optimise barrier properties and packaging applications. So, for instance, some of the modified starch polymers have been used in meat packaging. Okay, so now I'm skipping over to the second project which I wanted to talk about, which was polyhydroxyalkanoates. These materials are made from microbes. They have um, a unique, they're unique in terms of polymers in that they're not synthetic, they're not manufactured. The bacteria do it for us. So when I went to a, a talk last year, one of the first people to commercialise this material as polyhydroxybutyrate, um, a man by the name of Ernst Tungi, he was basically saying you have to think of this as a fact. This has been derived, this has been uh, evolved by the bacteria as the perfect carbon and energy storage for themselves. They actually have been using this for millennia. These polymers, which grow in this sort of bacteria, this is a wastewater treatment plant. I don't know if anyone has ever seen these treatment plants, but this grey matter is mostly bacteria. The bacteria is eating up any of the carbon, any of the waste carbon that comes in from the wastewater that goes into the sewage treatment plant and converting it to carbon dioxide or, and, uh, and using it to grow, basically. So what we're doing is taking what, they, what we call the sludge, the waste activated sludge from these treatment plants and because of the process they've been through in the whole cycle of the wastewater treatment plant, they're primed to grow this polymer internally. And the amazing thing is that it can be up to 90% of their weight is actually stored as these polymer granules. And when I say polymer granules, they're just like these balls. Like we have fat, they have these balls of basically, it's like an oil. It's, it's a, an amorphous liquid-like polymer that's stored in these stacks. And it's unique in that it is perfectly linear, perfectly pure, perfectly stereo-optically regular in a way that you cannot achieve synthetically. It's got no metal residues. And so it's, it's an amazing material to work with. We basically do, we do it an injustice by all the processes we go through to extract it. One of the things that we'd love to be able to do is just basically pop it out pure. But uh, even, with the, even with some of the impurities we introduce through the extraction process of this polymer, it is still a very high molecular weight very stereo regular, very nice polymer to work with. And the beauty of this material is because it is natural food for bugs, it is completely biodegradable in a way with which most other polymers can't achieve, including in the marine environment. So there's a natural metabolic pathway, and most of the materials we work with, we work with models for fermented waste, and in fact real fermented waste. So the trick is that you take these bacteria, you feed them, you starve them, you feed them, you starve them, you get them, you, you select for the ones that really like to accumulate this polymer because they've got the carbon reserves to get them through the starvation and then you can get those massive yields of, of polymer. And we have acetate and propionate as models for fermented carbon waste. So we're bringing in the, the waste activated sludge stream and fermenting carbon waste to give us acids as feed for bugs. And the trick that in our project is to ma manipulate how we feed these different ratios to, to control the polymer properties to get us the kind of materials that are going to be really good for films, for long elongation, high elongation materials. Essentially, we are covering everything from the basic metabolic processes. This is a model of the granule through to the final material properties and injection moulded or extruded final materials. And we've done every step along the process here. These are our materials at the top. These are commercial materials at the bottom. And this is what our materials look like after being buried in the soil. Highly biodegradable. This is after just 40 days. Okay. And that's typical of what you see because they are so such good food for bugs. But the other beauty about these materials is they're, they're water resistant, naturally water resistant. They don't dissolve at all. So they have 
great material properties for most of the applications we're looking at. Again though, we're working hard through using cheap waste resources and cheap processes to make these more cost effective compared to, say, some of the other commercial materials that are out there that are biodegradable. I just wanted to show you this because one of the beauties with working with PHA is that it is so pure and makes these incredible, large, beautiful crystals when, they're, when the polymers are um, crystallising and that's both a strength and a weakness. So one of the things we have to do is manipulate the polymer properties to get us good, malleable, ductile materials rather than brittle ones. Okay, so that's the first two topics I wanted to cover. Now I'm going to move across to the other area of research. And in this case, we're looking at combination films. So the Sustainable Films for Agriculture is a project through the CRC for polymers. And this is our goal. We want to develop polyolefin biopolymer compositions that offer property improvements and a renewable in component plus new degradable agricultural and industrial films. This is the second iteration of this CRC. So the first few years, the first um, six years of the project were involved in oxo-degradable films. Now we're moving into the oxo-biocombination materials. It's driven, the company we're working with is integrated packaging. This is a, a medium scale company down in Victoria and if you see most of the silage film around Australia, uh, the mulch film, so on, newspaper wrap, a lot of those applications, that typically integrated packaging is one of the principal manufacturers in Australia. We're working with Rice Research Australia, trying to look at the benefits of using some of these films for water retention in the early stages of rice growth. Obviously UQ, QUT are the researchers up here. CSIRO is doing a lot of um, modelling work and I think a lot of you would know the APSIM modelling system and that's being used in application for some of the predictive work through the use of um, some of the field trials we've been doing and correlating that with crop performance. Greening Australia is looking at these films for native plant uh, we want to see whether or not we can get, I'll tell you later about the heat units, but just getting the materials hot. Do we get more seedlings from, um, from seed than we would otherwise? Do we get better survival? And ANSTO is helping us with a lot of structure property relationship work, understanding the fundamentals of the kind of interfaces that we're getting with these materials. So there are a range of uses for these films in agriculture, but one of them is this crop propagation, so it's effectively using this film as a miniature greenhouse, covering the early stages of, uh, of plant growth and degrading in time for the plant to come through as it gets to that stage of its growth. This is the sort of contrast that you would get, for instance, in maize, where you have the maize that's pushed through and it's, it's benefited greatly from the heat units in the early stages of development in contrast to the control. And in a colder climate, you do see this, this massive early growth from that extra push along from the heat. One of the limitations with respect to any material development in an agricultural system is that really you only get one cycle a year because you've got to go with the field trial seasons. So we have to do a lot of iteration in order to develop our materials and it's on a, an annual basis which can be quite restrictive. So our cycle is film blowing. Um, we, we've been in the past doing a, a, a fair bit of work on toxicology and uh, environmental performance, lab trials, field trials, which is the one year, the limitation in terms of the cycles and then go back to the board, try again, keep developing our formulations to optimise the process. And within that, where there's a lot of work such as economic modelling, which has to go into this to see whether or not it's actually going to be economically feasible for the use of these materials. Um, we have to do model degradation work since we do have this limitation. How do we test our materials to see whether or not they're likely to be of any use in the field? 
a lot of work that goes into the types of materials that we're using and how we put them together. So when we say master batching, these, this can make a huge difference, just how they sit next to each other. How is it going to break down? What is it going to do? If we put the biodegradables in there, are they going to be in clumps or can we get uniform fragmentation? Soil activity, my earthworms germination, oven ageing, all of this. So there's a massive amount of equipment and there's also a massive amount of field work that has to be done. So again, we use the typical master batching, film blowing, as I showed you for starch, same processes, through to uh, various tests for activity. We um, have a new system called an Oxytop now, which looks at um, biological degradation and CO2 evolution. We have a system, a, a piece of equipment called a QSUN, which is a system for mimicking environmental ageing. So you can get temperature UV relative humidity in this cabinet and simulate as far as we, we can the environmental conditions. Oven ageing. One of the things about these films, the oxodegradable materials that is one component is supposed to be really promoted by ultraviolet light and temperature only. So a lot of the work that people have done in the literature and that we have done uses ultraviolet light and temperature to try and forecast ageing effects. But what we've actually found, and I'll come to that later as well, is that that's not a really great model. It's not a great way to test to see how, how long it's going to actually live in the field. So we have these model field trials out at Pinjara. I don't know if you ever go down near the river there, but we've got a fenced off area and lots of beds of soil where we do this testing of the film in practice. And it's really important for us to take that material that we've tested in the lab, correlate it with what happens in the actual field. And then we do these large scale field trials. And this is the equipment that's used. It cuts, cuts away, stretches the film as it goes and then buries it at the edges. Economic modelling as a predictor for the commercial outcome and then back to the chemistry. One of the things we're working hard on is taking all of the field trial data and trying to use it to build a model so we can forecast likely performance in the field, get a database, film environment, field trial performance um, to give us some sort of capacity to predict film performance so it's adaptable to new crops. Okay, so just as an example of what we're doing with accelerated ageing, so we do a lot of work either just over metal, where the film is just sitting on metal, or in fact simulating it over soil. So one of the very surprising outcomes for us was that if you look at natural soil, which was one that we brought in, versus the, the fourth soil, the krasnisms, the ferrosols um, from down in Tasmania, the very red volcanic type soils, and then uh, a mixture of the two, this soil really promotes and accelerates the degradation, even of just straight polyethylene. That's a complete surprise because there is nothing in the literature that would suggest that this is the case, that you would expect any difference with site. But one of the problems we do find is that there's a very big site variability for even uh, normal polyethylene degradable materials. So we're working on what the underlying mechanism of that is, how we can forecast it, how we can predict it, and how we can control it. This is an example also with the model field trial. So this is a Pinjara site where the films, we have this little circle above the soil. This is the exposed area where you can see that there's um, within 100, 120 days, you, it's, it's basically completely embrittled and nothing has happened under the ground. But with pre, we have a a treatment technology that we developed which was extremely effective and within uh, a few months basically under the ground was embrittled. But this particular pre-treatment technology is one that we can't use commercially because of, again, it, its cost turned out to be impractical, which is why the biodegradable component is so essential for getting this important under the ground embrittlement. Another thing that we, another type of material we've developed is one that actually whitens 
So as it ages, it, it, um, it goes from clear to white, which gives more control of the temperature underneath the film, and that's an advantage for some applications in horticulture. It acts like a, um, some of those white mulches that you see, prevents the heat gain. But if you don't have that sort of whitening effect, you do get, actually I'll just flick to this one. We're talking about temperature. You can get headspace temperatures up around 70 degrees underneath some of these films. It's, it's somewhat dependent on the soil type, as you can see here. So there's two different types, mudstone and clay. But if you're... If your outside temperature is about 30 degrees, you can expect under some circumstances that you might even be cooking some of these plants that's so hot. So we, we also have to be aware that the use of this film has to be controlled so that it's not stressing the plants. If we're going to use it in um, a range of environments, if you're using it in somewhere warmer like Birchip, we have seen in, uh, circumstances where we've killed the crop underneath just through this excess heat. There's an attenuation as well of the short wave radiation. So because underneath this film, it's extremely effective at trapping the moisture, the soil moisture, and it recirculates. So you get very little moisture loss. But with that, you get this beading of water underneath the film. And that just basically cuts out 30% of the radiation coming in. And again, we get a very strong linear relationship between ambient and headspace radiation. And again, difference with soil type. One of the things that for us is um, particularly striking is how elevated the carbon dioxide levels are underneath these films. You can get massive up to four four and a half percent CO2 levels just in that headspace, in that growing environment. And if you do have any vegetation present, so in this case, I know even though it's different soils, it gives you an example of what's happening. You get this diurnal pattern, but it's dramatically larger in the presence of plants. So it's always much greater than the photosynthesis synthesis saturation level. So one of the things we're doing with um, down in Tasmania is that they're actually at CSIRO and uh, University of Tasmania looking at the effect of these sorts of environments on crop physiology, what's happening with the stomata, what's happening with the root development and so on. How can we benefit from this sort of environment without you know, ending up with plants that are so stressed or that have um, physiological problems which don't adapt them well to life beyond the time of it, uh, the film has, in, has embrittled. The other thing that we wanted to focus on was understanding a little bit more as to why soils might affect this film degradation itself. And one of the things we realised fairly early on is, that, is though there's that there didn't seem, didn't seem to be any correlation with temperature. There didn't seem to, seem to be any correlation with UV exposure. But there did seem to be a very strong correlation with site. And that seemed to be associated with organic matter in the soils. We did some early tests where we basically took live and dead soils. So we um, killed all the bugs to see if, the, if, the, if it was the bugs that were evolving something that was affecting the plastic. And there was no difference. In fact, the dead soils seemed to, in, to be to accelerate the degradation more. So we thought, OK, it's, maybe it's a component within the soils. And we decided to look at the effect of the humic substances within the soils. And for, the, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, the fulvix, that's a, a typical fulvic there, a typical humic structure there. So the humics are the somewhat higher molecular weight components compared to the fulvix. And the humans are higher again. And this is typical of the sort of pattern that we see in the accelerated aging in the Q sun. So this is just straight polyethylene with no degradants added. And you can see that on its own, in a simulated environment, it can take 50 days to embrittle. 
you put you put it on top of soil like foresight, which is the one that really accelerates the degradation, and you're halving that degradation time. Other soils really don't have an acceleration effect. But if you put it over straight humic acid, that has the same effect as the fastest soil and it really promotes the degradation. And this is consistent across every material that we have tested so far. Interestingly, fulvic acids, which are the lower molecular weight ones, don't have this same acceleration effect. This is typical of the, the large scale application. In this case, this is Tasmania, uh, where we used it for um, potatoes. This was one of the whitening films, so you can see it looks bright white there by the time that it, it came to degradation. Uh, and it whitens within a couple of weeks and it embrittles within 40 days, 40, 50 days. This is what I was referring to before about the economic modelling and whether or not it was viable to use it in broad acre type applications. And really, uh, the answer was this is not likely to be something that is commercially feasible every year for a farmer to use. You'd have to use it only in seasons where it's forecast to be particularly dry and you can benefit from the water conservation in getting your yield. So this is the yield with no polymer and with polymer and you can see some years a much better yield. Most years no significant benefit because it, by the time you break through the film and you get to the end of the growing season the crop is basically uh, caught up, recovered, and there's really not a lot of difference. But other years like here, you can see where it was a particularly dry year, you would have got a lot of benefit from the use of the polymer. We're hoping that the continued use of APSIM model helps us inform the logical decision around the use of the, the types of crops to try this uh, process with and whether or not commercial outcomes are likely to be um, a good whether or not it's going to be a good risk for a farmer to use this material in a particular year for a particular application. So we're hoping to be able to direct crop selection and correlate field results with models. Okay, so overall, what we found is that sustainable and bio-based polymers can be processed, that we're working on optimising that processing, and they have properties that are basically like conventional polymers, so you can use them in drop-in processes. We need to work with, not against, the inherent properties of our materials to get tunable, sustainable polymers that will give us uh, an advantage that makes a difference in a cost-effective manner. And uh, there have been a lot of people working on this over the many years. Um, so there are 55 researchers to date across the multiple projects. And I'd particularly like to, to thank my team, um, who's and of course, Peter Halley, who at CHPP is responsible for most of the starch work. And of course, there's been a, a number of uh, funding bodies that have supported us over the years. <laughs>